Hi guys, it is an absolutely beautiful sunny winter day here in the great state of Texas here in the opening bell of the year 2020 and you have found your way to Collapse Chronicles. My name is Sam Mitchell and we do what we do here obviously is we chronicle the collapse of global industrial civilization and the planet. And guys, uh, before I get into this, I just I just want to give a little bit of a warning and a and a disclaimer and a Sam Mitchell disclaimer. I have mentioned many times because I bring a guest onto the show does not necessarily mean that I am advocating everything my guests are getting ready to say. Okay, I, I just want to make that clear to Homeland Security, anyone else listening to this, uh, I am not necessarily advocating what we're getting ready to hear, but I do think uh, it, it is a voice we need to hear. And who we're going to be hearing is a recommendation I received from none other than Derek Jensen, and this is this fellow named Max Wilbert who is a buddy of Derek's. And so for those of you not aware of Max, I, I have read out some of his stuff in the past here, but if you're not aware of Max <clears throat> from his website, Max Wilbert, it, Max Wilbert is a third-generation dissident who grew up in Seattle's post-WTO anti-globalization and undoing racism movement. He has been an organizer for more than 15 years. Max is a longtime member of Deep Green Resistance and serves on the board of a small grassroots nonprofit. He holds a bachelor's degree in environmental communication and advocacy from Huxley College. His first book, a collection of pro-feminist and environmental essays written over a six-year period was released in 2018. He is co-author with Derek Jensen and Lierre Keith of the forthcoming book, Bright Green Lies, which looks at the problems with mainstream so-called solutions to the climate crisis. And here on his website... Uh, Max says of himself, quote, I am part of a revolutionary movement rooted in ecology, anti-racism, feminism, and human and non-human rights that aims to dismantle the global culture of empire, read industrial civilization, by any means necessary. And uh, Max Wilbert, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this rollicking conversation. All right, Sam, thanks for having me on the show. It's good to be here, and thanks for that intro. Okay. So, guys, anyway, I was, uh, my, my, my first thought was I was going to build up to uh, this quote I'm getting ready to read uh, from Max, but I said, what the hell, let's just dive right into it. Uh, we're, we're, we're just going to get right into it. We're not going to revisit the laundry list of everything that is wrong with the global industrial civilization and the ongoing collapse of a planet. We're going to dive right in to what we need to do about it, and this is what Max Wilbert wrote a while back, and we're just going to pick up from here. So to kick off this conversation, here is what Max has to, had to say. We need to build legitimate movements to dismantle global capitalism. All work is useful towards this end. However, I see no way this goal will be achieved without force. The best methods I have come across for achieving this rely on a dedicated cadre forming small, highly mobile, and trained strike forces. 
these forces should target key nodes of global industrial infrastructure such as shipping, communication, finance, energy, etc., and destroy them with the goal of inciting cascading systems failure. The interconnected global economy is vulnerable to this type of attack because of how interdependent it is. If the right targets are chosen and effectively attacked, the entire thing could come crashing down. <laughs> uh, Max Wilbert, uh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Amplify and clarify what you have defined as decisive ecological warfare. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for reading that quote out. That was from an interview I did with a, a French friend of mine a while ago. And I, I tried to lay it out as straightforwardly as I could in that, in that, in that article. And, you know, it, it sounds pretty extreme to a lot of people. And it sounds like, you know, I think what the government would call eco-terrorism and what a lot of people would be very terrified by hearing what you just read. And I'm sure a lot of listeners are sitting back in their seats and thinking, what is this all about? This guy's a nut job, you know? <laughs> and I guess I want to, I want to push back on that a little bit. You know, I don't feel like a, an extremist. I don't think that I'm somebody who's crazy. I think that I'm somebody who's looking at the political realities and the ecological realities of the situation we find ourselves in as a species and coming up, trying to come up with a reasonable response to that, you know, and, and to me, that reasonable response for one, it's not going to rely on the government. You know, I mean, I think a lot of your readers probably are on the same page as, as me with this. And I think you probably are as well, but, you know, look at the incompetence of governments around the world to address the climate crisis and all kinds of different issues uh, the idea that they're going to solve these converging problems that we're facing in the ecological sense is a pipe dream. It's just not happening. There's no evidence that it's happening. Everything's getting worse day after day after day. And, you know, emissions continue to rise, you know, year after year. So if government is, isn't going to solve it, then people will need to solve it, right? And what does that look like? given the constraints that we have on our time, given the situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, I've had sort of some revolutionary leanings in my politics for a long time. You, you talked in my intro about how I grew up in Seattle and the post WTO. And there was this understanding in the communities that I came of age in politically, looking at, for example, the Zapatistas and, you know, all kinds of different revolutionary and people's movements around the world that Sometimes movements have to be forceful. Sometimes they have to use, you know, violence or what people would term as violence. I don't consider economic sabotage to necessarily be violence. Although, of course, you know, look at economic sanctions against uh, Iraq, for example, which killed a million civilians. That's more devastating than than any war can be. But um, but, you know, I think that we need to be clear eyed about these things. You know, I say this as somebody whose grandfather was a conscientious objector who refused to fight in World War II, which, you know, so many people look at World War II and talk about it as being the just war and the Americans fighting the Nazis and, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the Italians fascists and the, the, the Japanese fascist state. And, and, you know, the reality I think, as a lot of people know, anyone who's read, for example, People's History of the United States knows that the U.S. government didn't go into the Second World War with altruistic motivations. The motivations were imperialist, they were economic, and many people in the government and prominent members of U.S. society supported the Nazi regime from the very beginning, uh, up, one of the biggest examples being Henry Ford. Um, IBM, of course, work closely with the Nazis. We all know that. This is this is sort of beside the point. But you know, I say this as somebody again whose 
grandfather was a conscientious objector. I came of age politically in the anti-war movement, fighting the trying to stop the invasions of Afghanistan and then Iraq. So, you know, I'm not somebody who loves violence. I'm not somebody who wants to go out and cause destruction and, you know, impose my will on other people. That's not my ideology. I'm somebody who who values peace and basically wants to just have a good, quiet life, live a live a, live in a good way and have good relationships with the people around me. And I would be very content if I could just go live in the woods for the rest of my life with my loved ones and not have very much happen. That sounds great to me. But unfortunately, we're living in this global crisis and we need to come up with some sort of response to it. And all of the things that I look at, the government solutions, the corporate solutions, the greenwashing, all this stuff around alternative energy and green technology, the Green New Deal, all of these things, I look at them and they seem vastly disproportionate to the scale of the problems that we face. And we need fundamental economic and political change across the whole planet. I don't think that that is going to happen simply or easily. And frankly, I don't think it's going to happen willingly. I don't think people are willingly going to give up this life. You know, I was just writing an article last night uh, about, you know, my nephew who's two and a half years old and I'm hanging out with him recently and reading him books and so on. And like most kids, he's really into trucks. You know, he's really into the garbage trucks and the cranes and construction yeah. sites. And it's fascinating to him. It was fascinating to me when I was his age, you know. And I was writing last night about the the sadness, the tragedy that this kid growing up in urban an urban area is not going to be exposed to grizzly bears, to orca whales, to wolf packs. You know, the the megafauna of the past have been replaced by what I'm calling in this article I'm working on a mechafauna. Large machines have replaced large animals. And, you know, instead of navigating through a landscape of raging rivers and, and towering mountains and glaciers, we're navigating through a landscape of, of towering skyscrapers and freeways and, and businesses. So, most people are profoundly disconnected from the natural world. And I think because of that, we have all been inculcated into this ideology that looks at civilization and this way of life as it's even beyond a good thing. It's something that's so fundamental that it cannot be questioned. Most people literally cannot imagine living a different way of life than the modern industrial high energy way of life. Most people, at least in the United States where I live, can't imagine that, who I talk to. Some can, you know, some people obviously have more experience living off the land or living in, you know, communities and, and you know, in more intentional ways and can really imagine a much lower energy, smaller scale, more localized way of life, which is the only sustainable path for the future. But, you know, in terms of politically, if we think that that way of life, moving everyone on the planet away from high energy ways of life and dismantling those high energy systems, that's the only path towards survival that we have as a species. And that's the only way to stop the mass destruction that the dominant culture is perpetuating. And I don't see that happening willingly. There's just no signs that that's going to happen, at least on a large enough scale and a fast enough uh, timeline. Well, you mentioned what what was your phrase you mentioned five minutes ago? Eh? The the disproportionate scale of the response to the level of the the crisis, the problem, the predicament, and uh, 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 again, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here. So uh, so, uh, assuming that I agree with 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 everything you say. Uh, uh, that what we need to do is target key nodes of global industrial infrastructure such as shipping, communication, finance, energy, and destroy them with the goal of inciting cascading systems failure. 
the problem that I would have with that, on, on, on the assumption that I, that, that I agreed that was a, a noble goal, and I'm not saying whether I do or not, uh, but if I did, my problem, Max, would be the same problem I have with all of the other responses you mentioned, that there's no way in hell that we're going to marshal the forces necessary. It, it's, not, it's not even David versus Goliath at this point, brother. It's a goldfish versus a blue whale. What <laughs> would you say to get me on your team? Assuming I said, I agree, I want to join your team, but this is the reason I'm reluctant to. What would be your response to me? Well, the first thing I would say is if we don't try, then we'll never know whether it was possible. I mean, people have achieved plenty of incredible things throughout the history of the world, both for good and bad, that seemed incredibly unlikely in the beginning. And there's one quote that I like to spread around. It was from actually uh, Michael McFall, I believe, who was on the National Security Council. And he said, every revolution seems impossible beforehand and inevitable afterwards. So I don't think your sense, what you just said, I don't think that's a unique feeling. I think, you know, millions of people have felt that way throughout history in all kinds of different, difficult and dangerous political situations. And yet people still choose to fight. People still choose to organize. And of course, not everyone does. I, I don't expect everyone to join a movement like what I'm talking about. But you know, we need to find those people who are willing to to join, are willing to fight. And, you know, that not only means people doing that work, uh, you know, fighting for that, those, that cascading systems failure, going underground and taking serious action. I think it also means people who are just willing to speak up and and talk about this openly, because I don't think this is anything to be ashamed of or anything that needs to be discussed in the shadows. You know, I'm willing to go on national television and talk about this. I don't care because we're in a desperate situation. Yeah. And this to me is not any less mainstream than, you know, I mean, look at the politicians that you see on TV and these, you know, debates around the, the U.S. presidential election and so on. I mean, the stuff they're talking about is is completely out of touch in, in most cases with the realities of what we're facing. And... I look at those people as the extremists. I look at those people as the, the, the people who are insane and out of touch with what's actually happening in the world. So, you know, I think we need people involved at all kinds of different levels. And, you know, people hear what I'm saying and get scared. You know, this is serious stuff, obviously. I'm talking about revolutionary politics, really, in a sense. And that, that is a dangerous thing. Uh, it's dangerous now and it has always been dangerous. And I think one thing that people neglect is the fact that, you know, revolutionary movements involve people at all kinds of different levels. You know, I mean, there are people who are part of Deep Green Resistance, the group that I'm in, who are, you know, who are parents of young children who don't have any time, who don't have, you know, the ability to be a public face for the movement. People find ways to contribute, you know. People volunteer in all kinds of different ways. People translate articles. People donate. People do all kinds of different things to build a culture of resistance to support these ideas and build them up into a political force, a political movement that can actually influence the course of events. So that's what we're trying to do. And I understand people's feelings of, you know, disempowerment. And I think that you know, you look at mass media, you look at the culture that we live in, and that's one of the main goals of this system is to keep everyone in a position of feeling disempowered, of feeling a sense of total alienation, of feeling disconnection. And one of my experiences has been in, in political organizing and doing this work is that, you know, not only do I feel like I'm doing the right thing, but, you know, I find this work to be incredibly fulfilling personally. You know, I, I find myself with a sense of purpose that didn't exist you know, before I found this, these ideas, you know, when I was younger, I think I felt very swept along in global events. And now I feel like I'm part of an organized force that's working to change things. And, you know, the fact that we are outnumbered and outgunned and, you know, have no money and so on, <laughs> all of these things are, are realities that many other people throughout history have faced. So, you know, I look at myself as, as, and other people in this movement as part of a multi-generational 
struggle that has frankly been going on for thousands of years against the culture of empire. And, you know, we need to step up and, and, and step into that role. And I think it, it takes a lot of wisdom. It takes a lot of commitment and, and it takes a lot of self work to, to confront those fears, to have real conversations with yourself and your loved ones about what this could mean. And, you know, I, it takes courage and, you know, I would rather do this work than sit on a couch and watch Netflix for the rest of my life. So it, does that make me crazy? You know, maybe in the minds of, of some people in this culture, but I would rather be crazy than, you know, working 40 hours a week, slaving away at some job I hate, getting ready to retire into a climate nightmare. Okay, well, and leaving nothing, leaving nothing for future generations. So, okay, well, let's. Uh, there, 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 there's so many things I, I, I was trying to grab hold of uh, out of that response. One word that stands out to me in that response it was outgunned. Okay, you are. I. I, um, I Max has a fine YouTube channel himself. You can find Max's YouTube uh, channel. Uh, you have, and I noticed that the uh, the YouTube cop bots have not shut you down. I'm a little bit surprised that you are openly advocating on your YouTube channel to you know to start picking up guns. But I, I'm a little unclear. Talk, talk about that. Where literally does arming uh, ourselves fit in, in, into your program? I mean, guns have bullets. Where are you talking about uh, those bullets ending up? Well, to be clear, the, the strategy that you talked about, the decisive ecological warfare strategy, is explicitly uh, designed to minimize civilian casualties. That's something that has been a part of my our ethic from the beginning. It's not we're not talking about waging open warfare on you know governments or the industrial system. Uh, we're talking about sabotage. We're talking about coordinated economic sabotage. Now, you know I'm I'm not naive enough to say that that may not involve some violence against people. But that's not a call for me to make because I'm not directly involved in that process. We talk very clearly about the need for a firewall between people who are above ground and advocating these things like myself and people who go underground to actually take those type of actions. So I can't actually tell those people what to do and I don't know what they will do or what they are doing if they exist. So, you know, in, in, in some ways the point is moot, but, you know, you talked about my YouTube channel and I've made some videos, like you said, talking about weapons. And I, I see two main reasons for this. The first is self-defense. I think that we're entering a world that's getting increasingly chaotic and people like myself who advocate for, you know, what is seen as radical politics in this culture are at risk compared to a lot of other people. So you know, I receive death threats regularly. I receive, you know, all kinds of, of hateful messages from all kinds of different people. You know, I've been, I've been, I've been doing this for a while and that has been happening consistently and it's only speeding up. We're seeing increased polarization all around the world. We're seeing the increased rise of, of right-wing ultra-nationalist and proto-fascist movements. And that's something to be concerned about. That's a real that's a real concern. And I don't think that police or the state are ever going to protect people like me or even, you know, even pe people who aren't revolutionaries. Just, you know, look at look at the black community in the United States and all the violence that they have been facing for so long at the hands of the police and, and racist vigilantes. I think we need to learn to defend ourselves. And that doesn't mean we love guns or we build a stupid gun worshiping culture like the NRA, I think that that means that we be adults and we make reasonable decisions to preserve the safety of, of ourselves and our communities. And I think as climate 
crisis intensifies, we're going to see more and more instability and, and the potential for violence. So I want to see communities of resistance and especially communities that are engaging in on the groundwork, defending the land, um, building alternative communities and building alternative economies, excuse me, and ways to survive. I want to see those communities making serious decisions about what they're going to do, because, you know, if you have a great, wonderful, groovy eco village and some sort of climate disaster knocks out the local government, then, you know, you may have to be prepared for a, a bad situation. I mean, we have seen one of my friends is from Pakistan and she talks about, you know, we should look towards Pakistan as an example of what the U.S. and other more, you know, wealthy, quote unquote, first world nations are, are moving towards in the future in that, you know, you're seeing a lot of a lot of conflict. You're seeing a lot of sectarianism, violence, uh, blackouts and, and brown, rolling brownouts. Power is only available for certain periods of the day, a lot of desertification, uh, a lot of extreme poverty contrasted with extreme wealth. Um, and I think that's the future we're in for. You know, I say that and I also want to say that, you know, Rebecca Solnit wrote a book about natural disasters and about how people have this idea that when disaster strikes, you know, everyone becomes rapists and looters and things get really nasty and really bad really quickly. And she writes about how that's actually that's actually not what happens. That's much more the exception than the rule. And in general, when disaster strikes, people tend to come together and and work together and cooperate and help one another. And, you know, I'm not somebody who looks at human beings as um, inherently evil and nasty and it's going to get really bad and brutish. But for political organizers, for people who are specifically resisting civilization, capitalism, white supremacy, and so on, I think it makes sense to uh, to reasonably know how to use and own firearms legally. Um, the second The second reason that I talk about this issue is is almost in a sense more philosophical. And it's in the sense that, you know, in the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was written specifically uh, in a situation where people rose up to fight against a government and they used the weapons that they owned to do that. And then they wrote into the Constitution protections for people owning weapons. Um, obviously, the U.S., uh, the, the American Revolution was a, a bourgeois revolution. It was a high class revolution. It was a ruling class revolution, and it was not a, a grassroots people's movement. It was not a movement for for freedom or or progressive ideals. But nonetheless, I think the reality is true. It's true that preserving independence from the state is incredibly important. And I find it very hypocritical that many people on the left, for example, will critique the administration for building concentration camps and uh, for police brutality and violence, and then will turn around at this at the very same time and advocate for uh, taking away people's weapons, taking away weapons of the public. And of course, you know, mass shootings and all these different issues, they're, they're very serious issues and they're real issues. And at the same time, I think that, you know, preserving a, a population that is, that is armed is, is a bulwark against, against tyranny in some ways. And I, th I, th the other part of it too, is, you know, you look at the United States and there are a huge number of guns in private hands in this country, and the vast, vast majority of them are owned by conservative and far-right people. Not many are owned by people with progressive values who really value ecology and really value feminism and really value anti-racism. I'm not, I'm not saying that all conservatives are racist or whatever. Uh, that's, that's an oversimplification. But 
I think the fact that that is true, that all the weapons are concentrated in the hands of of the right is is not good. I don't think that's good. And I think as we see increasing instability, it makes sense to it makes sense to know how to use weapons. And again, that doesn't mean you glamorize them. That doesn't mean you worship them. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you plan some sort of armed attack against whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. But I do think that thinking about weapons and knowing how to use them can help move people on the left towards a greater sense of seriousness and a greater sense of, of power. Um, I didn't grow up in a gun culture at all. I didn't shoot a gun yeah. for the first time until I was 21 years old, maybe 22, 20, something like that. And, um, I, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a, a gun nut, you know, or anything along those lines. I don't, I don't really enjoy shooting guns at all, although I, I do practice it occasionally. Um, and I do hunt now um, because I like, I like to connect with the land and get my own food and, and get the best quality possible meat that's local and organic and has no chemicals in it and was grown on the mountainside, not in some factory farm. Um, but, you know, I think when you, when you critique the power of empire, when you critique U.S. imperialism, when you critique police brutality and you have never touched or fired a weapon, then I think that you perhaps have a skewed understanding or an incomplete understanding of what you're talking about. And I think this can lead to some dangerous ideas. Like people talk about the idea, many progressive people and leftists and people in the hippie community talk about things like, you know, violence doesn't work. You know, violence never works, which I think is just, a, it's a stupid idea, frankly. I think the reality is that unfortunately violence works really well. Uh, that's why that's why the U.S. military uses it. That's why the police use it. That's why abusers and, you know, wife beaters use it because it is very effective. And that's not that's not a good thing. But again, I think we need to be adults and face these realities. Yeah, when I I, I know that you of all people are are keeping up with the trends and the in the skyrocketing number of environmental defenders being just flat out murdered by by these guys. When I was reading something sometime in the past few months, you know about these one of these tribes in Brazil, uh, you, you know you know these warriors talking about that they were going to be picking up, you know, and actually. And, and 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 they need to be defending their land base. I am one hundred percent in support of uh, of an Amazon indigenous person uh, using violence uh, to defend their their land base and and their culture and whatnot. But at the same time, Max, I'm thinking to the back of my in the back of my head, there is nothing. That this Bozo Nero guy, as I call him, there is nothing that Bozo Nero would love more than an Amazon Indian to put an arrow through the throat of a, you know, of a soy farmer or a or a gold miner or someone building uh, a hydropower dam are you following me that then you would yeah. see the uh what what the uh what violence would look like it would be a bloodbath and they would say mm. well they threw the first punch that this mm. guy with his bow and arrow killed some guy building, you know, dri ride, driving a bulldozer, or building a hydroelectric dam. Do you see where I'm going with this? And it would just be, while I would be cheering on the guy with the bow and arrow, I know what it would turn into, brother. And what right. do you think about that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And that's why I think we can't get caught up in dogma because, you know, just like I... I'm not a dogmatic pacifist. I'm also not a dogmatic advocate of violence. I think you need to be situational in the methods that you choose to use to achieve a certain goal. And if you are trying to defend your land, you know, then in, in many contexts, the best way to do that is going to be completely nonviolently. And that's 
that's not a problem for me at all. I've participated in countless nonviolent actions and direct action blockades and protests and media events and all kinds of stuff on that spectrum. So, you know, I don't think that that's a contradiction at all. I think we need to be flexible in the way the, that we approach these things. But I also think that we need to avoid blaming the victim. And I think we need to recognize that, you know, although, of course, what you're saying is true, you know, they, the, the state will use violence as an excuse whenever it can. The reality is the state's going to be violent no matter what. You know, the corporations are going to be violent no matter what. They're going to that violence may take different forms depending on the situation, but their modus operandi is violent. Uh, and whether they are sending in the military or whether they are using international trade agreements and and unfair loaning practices from organizations like the WTO and the World Bank that, that force massive infrastructure projects on poor indigenous people and rural people all over the world, or whether we're talking about you know, banks here in this country and how they function and how they keep the poor poor and exploit people, uh, they are using violence every single day. That is their main tool. And so our choice should not be some moral abstraction about, you know, not that morality is, is abstract, but I think that we need to be looking at what methods are going to be effective to stop them and not artificially constraining ourselves based on you know, a morality that, that, frankly, I think we've been taught often. I think there's a reality that we're taught Martin Luther King in schools, and we're not really taught about Mal Malcolm X, and we're not really taught about the Black Panthers, and, you know, we're not really taught about revolutionary movements around the world, except for, again, the bourgeois American revolution. And we have all internalized that training. You know, again, I think there's a reason that we're taught so heavily about figures like MLK and Gandhi, and, you know, even a figure like Nelson Mandela, who's lionized in the United States and looked at, a, at this amazing figure. Well, very, very few people recognize that he was the leader of an underground military organization that was attacking and assassinating people in the apartheid government and the apartheid state and was coordinated, was coordinating uh, sabotage attacks against the electrical grid, against diamond mines, against power stations. And, you know, that that side of of the apartheid resistance has been completely whitewashed. And instead, you know, we're taught all about Desmond Tutu and nonviolent protest and truth and reconciliation. And the reality is that social change and revolutionary change throughout history has always been a messy process with a lot of different pieces and a lot of different people working in different ways. And, you know, I don't think that that means that you have to be opposed just because you're using different tactics. And I think that ideally the strongest movements do use all kinds of different methods and all kinds of different tactics um, across the spectrum and, and they're coordinated and they support one another and they're not going to condemn one another for, for using different methods. They're going to, just work in the most effective way that they can. Okay, I would. Uh, there, there, there is some. I, I have. We're, we're still on the first paragraph of. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're forty <laughs> minutes into this, brother, and, and, and I've made it exactly one paragraph into into this whole list of quotes of yours. I wanted you to expand on. So I, I'm going to kind of uh, give. I'm, I'm just going to leave my notes behind and. Uh, Okay, uh, you mentioned in some, somewhere in the in the past ten minutes, and you've written about this uh, about whether humans are inherently, or you, you know, uh, I've like I just interviewed this this ecologist named William Rees. You should probably go listen to that interview. It was the last one of mm. 2019. Who you know, who, who's based from an ecological perspective, if not from a moral one, you know, saying humans, are, anyone to claim that humans are not a plague on this planet. It's, I want to draw and find out where your line is. I don't know whether you're speaking for deep green resistance. I just want to hear your own line. I, I want to make clear that I understand that you draw a big 
line, a big line between global industrial capitalism, civilization, that, that whole messy thing, and humanity as, as, as a species that you, that you put those in kind of two separate camps. While I think a lot of people listening to this podcast probably agree with you 100% on the global industrial civilization, Right. Is, is the worst reflection of humanity, and, and we can all agree it needs to go, at least the people down in this rabbit hole. But, uh, but, but some people would say that we, we just need, that's, that, that even that's not going far enough, that we need to take the, uh, th that humans just need to go. What is your comment to the people saying that ending global capitalism still is not enough to save the planet and we just need to have humans say bye-bye and disappear? Well, I think that's a profoundly civilized thing to say. I think that's only something that you can say if you grew up in a culture that is destroying the planet which not every culture has done. And, you know, I grew up in a culture that's destroying the planet. I grew up in a city and grew up with cars and everything. So I can, I can certainly understand the impulse and why people feel that way. But, you know, the thing is, people who are saying that are, are looking at history and interpreting it in a certain way. And the reality is you can look at the same history and interpret it in a different way. Or you can talk to people and look at situations where people are actually living in land-based communities and see what's happening ecologically, see what's happening to the people. Uh, so there are thousands of examples of cultures that have lived, you know, more or less in balance over the long term with the natural world. And I think that this is actually an adaptive trait for human beings to, to live in sustainable ways. And I think that human beings are, are for that reason, we are sort of born naturalists. If humans are just given a little bit of training and a little bit of, uh, of education and, and encouragement to learn about the local ecology and immerse themselves and, and you know, exist within a living ecology, then I think that we can do it extremely well. And that's not to say that human beings don't influence in ways that could be called destructive, what's happening around them. Because I think that quite obviously humans are an apex predator and apex predators always disrupt and change the world around them and always influence things, especially when they come into a new habitat for the first time. They're going to upend things. They're going to make a lot of changes. But that's no different than if you don't have wolves in an area, say, and then wolves show up. They're going to cause you know, very similar changes to the ecology on a large scale. That doesn't mean that wolves, you know, nobody's saying that wolves are inherently destructive, right? I think humans are no different. And so I think that, you know, for example, people look at the, the wave of extinctions that has followed uh, with some species when, when indigenous peoples first showed up in, in certain areas, you know, um, especially, for example, you know, some of the Polynesian cultures, you know, when, when, when people first showed up in, in North America, you know, there's 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 debate about these issues and they're not well understood because obviously we're talking about ancient history. We're talking about very limited records from from archaeology here. So we're just interpreting the, the past. Right. And that's very limited. But what it appears like happened in these situations is that humans, again, an apex predator showed up in an area. They caused a lot of change. They may have caused a few extinctions. And then things settled down. People figured out how to live in that area in a way that was balanced. And things more or less stayed the same for thousands of years after that. That That is sustainability. And that's an adaptive trait for human beings. And I think that, you know, again, if you have not lived in that way, then it's hard to perceive how that can happen. When you have grown up in a completely growth-based culture in a, you know, Judeo-Christian, Abrahamic religion, worldview of growth and patriarchy and as many children as possible and no relationship to the local ecology, then 
you're going to look at that with skepticism. But the reality is that human beings, our natural state is an animistic state where we are in real everyday relationship with the natural world around us. And we develop individual personalized relationships with certain places, a certain creek, a certain river, a certain forest, a certain herd of deer, a certain population of salmon, a certain family of grizzly bears. And we learn their habits and their ways and we watch them not just for days or hours, but for years and generations. And we tell stories about them and we communicate about them with each other. And we pass information down over time and we develop ways to, to live while not destroying these beings who are around us, who we love. And that is so alien to most people in this culture today. Most people literally cannot comprehend that because of, of the human supremacism that we're inculcated with from birth, you know, that, that it seems completely unthinkable. So, you know, I would disagree that, that humans are inherently destructive. I think that that is completely wrong. And I think we can be incredibly destructive. Uh, but I think that, you know, essentially, you know, when it comes to the nature versus nurture argument on this, I think it's all about nurture. And I think that humans are a very flexible species. And when we are raised in a destructive civilization, that has no respect for the natural world and has this growth imperative, then things are going to go downhill fast. And that's not just modern culture. I think that's the story of the last 10,000 years. That's civilization as a whole, going back to the fertile crescent, the so-called fertile crescent that's no longer fertile anymore. Because, you know, again, I think Derek said this on your show, but the first the first written story of civilization is is about Gilgamesh cutting down the forest, yeah. right? To to build a city and and to to build an empire and army and and to become wealthy and powerful. That is the first written story of civilization, and it's the first written story. Civilization had existed for quite a while before this this story was written, from 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 what we understand, and. You, you know, the archaeology, what the archaeology tells us is that indigenous peoples, people living outside of civilization, people living outside of mass monocrop agriculture, lived in balance for hundreds of thousands of years around the world before civilization came. And when that transition to civilization happened, then you start seeing massive destruction. So, you know, for example, global warming, a lot of people think it began with the Industrial Revolution and with uh, the burning of coal and, you know, steam engines and so on. That's not actually true. Global warming actually began with civilization and the beginnings of, of widespread agriculture. And, for example, if you look in the ice core data, I think about 3,800 years ago, something something in that range, don't quote me on that number, uh, you see a big spike in methane emissions, and that corresponds with the beginning of rice paddy agriculture in Southeast Asia. And there's a climate scientist named William Rudiman who argues and, and demonstrates from the data that the amount of greenhouse gases released by agriculture and the destruction of habitat through the rise of civilization, the amount of carbon released by that is roughly equivalent to everything that has been released during the entire industrial period. It just happened over 10,000 years instead of over wow. 250 years. So these problems are not new. And for that reason, I think it's easy for people to look back at 10,000 years of history and say, look at how destructive we've been. But the point is you have to go outside history and you have to go into prehistory because you know these indigenous communities before civilization did not have written records. And uh, you know indigenous cultures... You know, today and during the last 10,000 years that have existed and have remained intact have lived in profoundly different ways. And, you know, this isn't to to lionize or uh, or sort of falsely idolize indigenous peoples, because I, I think a lot of indigenous communities can be critiqued on all kinds of different issues. And 
you know, we all have disagreements about the best way to live and, and, you know, not all communities that people call indigenous live sustainably or have lived sustainably at all times. I think that's, of course, a vast oversimplification. We're talking about thousands of cultures over thousands of years of history. So we can't, we can make some broad generalizations, but, you know, it's dangerous to say that it's always this way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I hate to, uh, to, to kind of shift gears, uh, quickly here, but we're already 50 minutes, so I, I've only got five minutes left to discuss what I was hoping we were going to have, 15 minutes. One thing, let, let, That's fine. One thing that I, I surely I think you can agree on, one of my um, this, one of the things that I found missing in your work is, uh, you, is you do not seem, maybe I just haven't gotten to it, to talk about the issue of overpopulation very much. And I just want to say, sure, I know that you understand if global industrial civilization comes down, that is going to mean the population of this planet is going to come down with it. Uh, is that a good thing, a bad thing? Have you ever thought about what a sustainable human population living in balance with nature looks like on planet Earth? Yeah, I think, of course, that's a huge issue, and I've thought about it a lot. And, you know, in, in terms of your last question, I don't, I don't have a number and I don't think I could, that's not something that I can dictate. It's something that obviously will change depending on the ecological circumstances that people find themselves in. But, you know, the, I think the, the, uh, the leading writer on this topic was William Catton, whose book yeah, Overshoot yeah. is one of the most important books that's ever been written, I think. And uh, it and Endgame are my two. I, those Derek Jensen's Endgame and William Catton Overshoot. Uh, those are the right. ones I put at the top of my list. But but clearly you don't see what I mean. Th th this house of cards is coming down. You and I both know it, Max. Whether we bring it down or it comes down itself, but surely. You do not. Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Do you believe that we're going to be living on a planet of 10 billion people uh, in 40, 50 years from now, or is that number going to be a whole hell of a lot less? Well, that's that's actually an interesting question. I think I I may actually differ from a lot of the collapse people on this because I don't actually think that collapse of this culture is a given in the short term in that sort of time frame. And oh, really? I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't think it's a given. I think it could happen, but I, it does not seem faded at all to me. And I say that as somebody who traveled to the Arctic in a climate science expedition and has walked <laughs> on thawing permafrost. I'm very familiar with all the feedback loops and the, the methane burp potential and all these different issues. We don't know what's happening. You know, we don't know how fast these changes are going to happen. But, you know, the reality is that I think this culture continuing to sail along and grow and grow and grow is the worst possible outcome. And I think that even if nothing changes and nothing gets worse, we already have enough reason to resist now. So, you know, I, I don't know what the future is going to look like. And I think that you are right that, you know, the human population is not sustainable and it's going to be lower at some point in the future. And there are a lot of ways that that could play out. You know, it could be really bad and just a ton of people all die, very violent, horrible deaths. Or it could be achieved in a sort of more planned, um, humane way um, by simply redu reducing the birth rate and letting natural deaths reduce population. Um and I think that, you know, maybe the reality or how it will play out will be somewhere in the middle. I don't I don't know. Um, but, you know, this issue is one of the reasons why I think feminism is such an important topic, because I think that the whole issue of overpopulation is incredibly tied up with agriculture and with uh, with patriarchy. And I would say the most important writer on this topic is Lear Keith, who her book, The Vegetarian Myth, it, it's sort of focused around the idea of diet, but uh, it, it, it's really about 
uh, patriarchy and agriculture and civilization. And she points out rightly that, you know, within agriculture, within civilization, uh, maximizing the number of births is the best way to increase growth. That's the best way to make workers available for the workforce to, to work in the fields and the factories and, and to serve in the army. And the coordinated uh, culture of control and domination, male domination, that is patriarchy, is something that has existed for a long time at this point. And all around the world, when you have examples of women actually gaining some level of political control and actually uh, gaining autonomy and pushing back the powers of uh, of of the Abrahamic religions and pushing back the powers of of patriarchal society, you see birth rates just plummet. And you know, I I think I the human population is unsustainable and it's going to be lower. And I would prefer that that happen in a, as humane a way as possible. Yeah. Okay. And I would uh, I, I think again I I I I I really hate to break in here, brother, but. I am glad to say I'm going to be interviewing Lierre in in a few weeks. Uh, So I guess I will pick up with her on the book Bright Green Lies since we did not have time to get to it. But we're going to collapse here in a few minutes. So Max Wilbert, uh, if if you've ever heard one of my interviews, you know how I always end them. If you were not speaking with Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles where you had free reign for an hour but you actually had the mainstream media with a microphone in your face saying, Max Wilbert, give us your 60-second soundbite to humanity and the opening bell of 2020. What would those 60 seconds sound like? Well, the problems that we're facing are massive, and the political systems are capable of addressing them. So many of the solutions that we're seeing, such as green energy, are turning out to be false solutions. We're seeing a huge explosion in green technology, and yet at the same time, emissions continue to climb and pollution continues to climb. So what do you do with that? I think we need fundamental change. We need broad economic change. And I think that looks like a complete restructuring of the global economy. And how this could happen, there are many different ways. And, you know, I want to support people who are working for these type of goals, working for degrowth, working for relocalization, working for permaculture. Uh, I want to support people who are working in all kinds of different ways. For myself, I have chosen a, a revolutionary path because I think that not only do we need to build up those alternatives, but I think we need to be prepared to dismantle the dominant systems of power that are destroying the planet. I don't think they're going to stop willingly. And so I would invite people who are interested in, in learning more about that or getting involved in that to, to reach out to me and let's get connected. And, and so you can become part of this culture of resistance because it's our only chance. And I think that we are the inheritors of a beautiful tradition and, we are living at perhaps the most important moment in the history of the human species. And what happens in the future is completely dependent on what we do now. Okay. And with, with that, Max Wilbert, I, we're going to have to wrap it up. Stick around for a minute after I, I finish this up. But guys, if you enjoyed this, uh, please take a few seconds to thumb it up. Or if you did not enjoy it, please take a few seconds to thumb it down. But right now, I hate to say this, but we're going to have to say, Max Wilbert, thank you very much for taking an hour out of your schedule to come talk to us on Collapse Chronicles. But more importantly, thank you for your work and keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. It's been great. Bye, guys.